Hello, my name is Devin Bowers. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I've worked on code integrity systems in Windows since I graduated in 2017 and started Linux kernel development since this past October. I am here to present on integrity policy enforcement, otherwise known as ITE, an upcoming LSM which seeks to solve the problem of code integrity. I'll also be explaining how IPE can be used to achieve pull system verification for lockdown systems. Initially, I'm going to talk about the motivation for IPE, why we thought a new OSM was necessary, why existing implementations cannot be extended. This will be followed by a brief introduction to the design of IPE, as well as complications that came up during the development and how some of these complications were addressed. I'll finish up with a 20 minute demo and a few comments on our plans for future work on IPE. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to these people who participated in the design of IPE from the beginning or gave a large portion of their time to review the early drafts of IPE, as well as teach me some of the nuances of Linux kernel development. Also, a special shout out to Josh Karan Karana, otherwise known as JK, who pioneered the initial versions of IPE, as well as laid much of the groundwork for what we have today. So quickly going over the basics of code integrity, Code integrity is the concept that code hasn't been tampered with and transitioned between its source, be it a build machine or distributed by an application developer, and its execution. In other words, files are guaranteed to be identical to where those files are built. This has a wonderful property of defeating a lot of low effort attacks like malware being directly executed, LD preload, tampering with a binary, or even ptrace attacks. Additionally, this concept can be generalized to more than just executable code. It can be applied to high value files like configuration files that could be vulnerable to file system attacks. So how do CI and Mac interact with each other? Well, CI performs a complementary function to Mac. Mac systems require file metadata to make their decisions. This implies that they have a dependency on that file's metadata not being altered. CI, in theory, fulfills this dependency by enforcing file integrity, encompassing the entirety of the file, including metadata. In other words, CI provides the integrity that Mac assumes. So let's design a lockdown system. Starting at the bottom layer, we're going to protect the kernel and the bootloader through a verified boot solution, something like uBoot, Verified Boot, or Secure Boot. We can also add in the kernel lockdown LSM as well as LKRG for some additional hardening. After that, we move a bit up the stack and we'll select a way to measure and test the state of the device. The natural choice here is IMA. Now at our final layer, we need to select a Mac system to encompass the security policy for the whole device and a CI system to ensure that Mac functions correctly. We have many options for Mac. We have AppArmor, SE Linux, etc. For CI, all we have is IMA. Additionally, we could lock out the lock down the file system a bit more at the file system layer through FS Verity, DM Verity, or authenticated VRTFS, which provide a measure of ver integrity verification. So why not use IMA? IMA selects its files through metadata and verifies the content, not the metadata of the file. If we're trying to get around the CI block, easy solution. We offline mount the file, change the metadata to bypass the policy, and we've now pwned the CI system. IMA solved this problem through extended verification module, otherwise known as EVM. EVM introduces additional metadata to secure the metadata of that file. The issue here is what happens when we offline mount the file, change the EVM metadata, and then change the IMA metadata. The obvious solution here is we just appraise everything. Assuming we care about enforcing integrity checking on reads, that isn't realistic. There's gonna be some subset of files that are not integrity checked at the very nature of those files making it impossible to fix log values to. Logs, for example. The more glaring problem here is that it introduces a circular dependency with the Mac system. CI is assuming metadata from Mac, and Mac is assuming file integrity from CI. This falls apart quickly. On top of direct metadata attacks, can we really predict the number of ways an attacker can manipulate the file system to change the metadata? Bind mounts over files with the required metadata to skip policy, hard links. In general, the file system is a very fragile thing controlled by user land. We really can't trust it to make any decisions. And also, what about memory attacks? 
and map read write and protect execute would be completely uncaught by MA. You could do that fairly easily. What about anonymous memory? These kinds of attacks have been completely untested. So can we do better? The file system is scary, so can we remove it as a factor in evaluating what's allowed to run? Can we remove control from user land to manipulate the output of the policy? Finally, there's so much existing work with integrity systems in the kernel already. Can we just use one or all of them for the way we check the integrity of the system? This leads us to the core design goals of IP, enforcing user-defined system integrity requirements, separating integrity mechanisms from the policy mechanism, removing the dependency on file system metadata, and enforcing a hard security boundary between user space and kernel space. The goal of the customizable uh, integrity requirements leads us to a policy. So what makes a good policy? Ideally, a policy is intuitive. People should be able to understand it without looking up technical terms or being extremely nuanced about a specific system. The second requirement is that a policy should be diagnosable. When a policy goes wrong, a layperson should be able to diagnose the issue without requiring a developer or an expert in the system itself. In simple terms, it shouldn't require a PhD or a specialization to understand and utilize a policy, unlike web development and assembly. To achieve an intuitive policy, there needs to be a few obvious characteristics. The policy language needed to be simplistic and easy to read. So we decided pretty quickly that the policy should be interpreted from top to bottom, use the new line to delimit rules in the policy, and use key equal value syntax for the individual items within our rules. The next choice was how to abstract the policy rules for the end user to establish control over the kernel in a simple way. Initially, we considered using the LSM hooks as the operation to be controlled. However, we discarded this for fear that it would become too complicated for an average admin to understand with all the nuances within the kernel. It also had the drawbacks for the future. If some system call that allowed execution in a different hook than we expect, then policies would need to be updated to handle the new kernel functionality. To this end, we decided to go with the logical mapping what we intuitively expect to control, in this case execution, which could potentially come through mmap with execute permissions, execve, or mprotect with execute permissions, or whatever comes into the future. The next choice for the policy was what should it do if no rules match? It's nearly impossible to write a policy so exhaustive that it covers the whole system, so this is important. We did draft for a deny by default, which was great for execution rules, as this encompasses the entire system. But the rules were confusing to author for other scenarios, like enforcing reads of verified files for specific cases. The next attempt we had was the inverse, allow by default. This was great for the verified read scenario, but it fell a bit short in the execution space. So from there, we decided to borrow a bit from PEP20. Explicit is better than implicit and have a user specified default based on logical mapping. This made intuitive sense based on what the policy was trying to achieve. So our next a requirement, the ability to diagnose policies, we had plenty of experience to draw from. The other members of my team I at Microsoft work on the Windows side of CI, and we have had plenty of problems because Windows CI problem policy is not diagnosable. The reason why it's not diagnosable tends to track back to the decision to use an intermediary binary format, which cut down on the parsing code in the kernel. This decision led to several things, requiring the maintenance of a serializer, the binary format could change between versions, additionally there is no deserializer because some of the information is stripped away. What's serialized may not match the original policy. All of this leads to the ability for people to perform self-service diagnosis of policies. So learning from our past mistakes, we chose to pursue a plain text policy, removing an intermediary format. This addresses all of the larger issues found in our study of Windows CI policy, but has a few drawbacks. Authoring has less guardrails as the serializer can catch some mistakes and output them to the end user. And ultimately, because it is a giant string, it has a larger memory footprint. The other thing we considered from a diagnosis standpoint is the actual evaluation of a policy. One choice would be to read in the full policy 
optimize the policy and then evaluate against the optimized policy. This was not chosen because it results in difficult debugging. Roles may not be evaluated consistently, and it could be a victim of optimization logic, which is its own class of bugs in code today. Instead, we decided to evaluate as is. It prevents a certain order of uh, optimizations, as we cannot reorder rules, but it's easy for a human to understand and debug the policies, as authoring policies tends to be the optimizing factor. So when we put all of our design decisions together, we get a policy that looks a bit like this. This is a theoretical example policy that may be typical for a lockdown system that wants to control all of its execution in a subset of reads that must resolve to a verified file. Our second goal for IPE was to divorce mechanism from policy. There are several good systems within the kernel that can be extended with minimal effort to provide some assurances of integrity. So what makes a good integrity mechanism? Well, it's not controllable by user land. If that's possible, then what's the actual security value in the first place? Secondly, the mechanism should be deterministic. The value resolved by the integrity mechanism should not change between different evaluations. Finally, as a stretch, it ideally captures the life of an application. While an application runs, it can do a lot of sketchy things. I've seen binaries download an arbitrary shared library off the internet and try to use DL open or execute it. I've seen a shared library being executed from a data section. In fact, this is, solution is the highest upvoted response to a cross-platform.net assembly that calls a native binary on Stack Overflow. I've also seen a library that sprays an executable code fragment and attempt to map it into an executable page and execute it. The point is, if your integrity mechanism can capture the lifetime of, of a normal usage of the application, then all of these should be caught. Some examples of good integrity mechanisms are DM Verity, FS Verity, Authenticated BRTFS, as all of these would at least fulfill the first two bullets. In IP's first patch set, we support DM Verity as an integrity mechanism. The TLDR of DM Verity is that files are verified by a Merkle tree. Corruption or tampering will cause the block to fail to be read. For IPE's purposes, DM Verity creates a block device structure that's resident in the kernel. I integration with IPE is simple. We store some info in a security blob on the block device structure, and we check it later with IP in the correct hook. Now that we're done with all the supporting factors of IPE, I'm going to go into the two major aspects of IPE itself, the policy loading mechanism and the evalu policy evaluation mechanism. Policy loading is in IPE is straightforward. The policy must be signed to establish the root of trust to the system trusted keyring, or else it would be trivial for an attacker to deploy a policy to undermine the security of the device. This keyring is special as it is a keyring that is compiled into the kernel and cannot be modified without rebuilding the entirety of the kernel. IPE uses the PKCS7 assigned data format which encompasses both the policy and the signature in one convenient blob. This blob is written to SecurityFS which causes IPE to parse the policy. IPE parses the policy line by line, tokenizing it to key equals value pairs. IP looks up the key against the red-black tree of registered mechanisms, also known as properties. This key entry is a st structure of function pointers, a version, and a name. One of those function pointers is a parse function, which accepts the value half of the key equals value pair and stores that in an opaque void star pointer. If the parse function returns success, IP continues or else it ex exits early and terminates the parsing. On success, IPE stores the policy in the private section of the inode of the new SecurityFS entry for the policy where it lies in kernel space, inactive until the policy is activated as the active policy through SysFS. Evaluation is very similar to the parsing function. All of these calls funnel into the LSM hook, which calls IPE process event. This iterates over the policy where a reference to each mechanism's registry is stored. IP calls the mechanism's evaluate function, passing the file pointer to its mechanism. If all the mechanisms of a role match, then it short circuits and returns the action property 
Otherwise, it continues on to the next rule until a match occurs, or until it runs out of rules, at which point it falls back to the default. We came into a bunch of challenges with IP across its development. The first issue we came across was the authorization of initRAMFS. initRAMFS is obviously not a DM Verity volume, but it is typically verified as part of a verified boot stack. To that end, we created our own mechanism based on the tested implementation of the load pin LSM, which caused the first mounted super block that executed something to be authorized. And then when this super block is unmounted, then nothing else can be authorized by that logic. As initRAMFS is the first mounted super block, this all works out. The system just needs to remember to unmount initRAMFS to prevent writing to that authorized location. The second problem that came up was map anonymous. Anonymous memory is inherently incapable of being integrity verified because it cannot trace back to anything with a backing that could be used to establish the trust of its data, but there are valid uses of it. One such valid use is dynamic code generation, used primarily in two places that we were concerned about. The first was foreign function invocation, which is used in almost every language in today's systems when calling from one language to another. LibFFI accomplishes this by creating a trampoline to the destination library, which it first attempts to do by mapping the region of anonymous memory with write permissions and then filling in the trampoline and then marking it execute. If we have our Mac system with no exec mem, this will fail because write memory can never be marked execute. Additionally, it fail in IPE because there'd be no file backing. When that fails, libffi attempts to write an executable code fragment to the system, then mem map the file as execute. This fails in IP as it doesn't trace back to anything verified. As cross-language calling is a pretty desirable feature to any de developer, we're looking at addressing this problem through a separate series of patches to the kernel. Another point of mention is GCC closures, which require the same form of trampoline to function appropriately. Script interpreters also represent another challenge, as these files are opened with not plus x, but in fact read. So they are not subject to IP's execution rule set. Fortunately, the community has already realized this issue and has started the process of creating a potential solution through OMA exec. The first thing we're going to do is generate a self-signed certificate to establish IP's root of trust. We're going to use OpenSSL just to quickly create a self-signed certificate with a private key that we're going to use to sign things later. After that's done, we're going to move on to kernel setup. Um, so we're just going to open up our kernel repository, set the default configuration for x86-64, and let's edit it slightly. So from here, we're going to enable kernel configs. Uh, the first kernel config we'll enable is DM Verity. The option is under device drivers, multiple driver device driver support rate and LVM. Uh, device mapper support should be enabled as well as Verity target support. And we're going to also enable Verity data device root hash signature verification support. After that, we're going to make a quick stop in file systems. We're going to enable Fuse as a module. This will be used later in order to demonstrate uh, how to block or allow kernel module loads. And we're also going to enable the SquashFS file system driver to allow us to mount our SquashFS. We can now enable IPE. We're going to enable SecurityFS as a dependency of IPE. We're also going to disable SE Linux and IMA just for the purposes of this demo. So we're going to navigate to the Integrity Policy Enforcement menu, enable that. We're going to go into the submenu, enable all the properties. The policy to be applied at system startup is going to be left blank. We'll come back to that later. Our final option is in the cryptography menu. Uh, we're going to go down all the way to the bottom and compile in our certificate to the system trusted keyring. This will establish IP's root of trust uh, for all of its cryptographic verifications. With our config complete, we're going to now start our kernel compile. Um, we're going to wait a couple seconds before we continue just to ensure that everything is going to work out. Looks like everything's going to work out, so we're going to split off a pane and we're going to create a DM Verity volume that we're going to use in the demo.
So the first thing we're going to do is create a SquashFS of our demos folder. It's pretty easy. The package is SquashFS tools on most distros. And you just type in make SquashFS, the folder you're trying to compress, and then the output file. We now need to set up our SquashFS volume with DM Verities. We're going to run Verity setup format on our SquashFS volume. This will generate the hash tree used by DM Verity, as well as output the root hash to standard out. Um, we're going to save the root hash by copying that root hash and echoing it with the dash n parameter to a file. Uh, the dash n parameter is very important because it strips the new line from the, the output. And then we're going to sign it using OpenSSL smime, uh, pointing in at the key and the certificate that we created way back when. And we're just going to do this twice so that we have two separate hash trees and two separate root hashes so that we can show authorization and denial by root hash. It's now time to create our IP policies. Uh, we're first going to create a policy named boot. We're going to give it a policy version of zero. Uh, we're going to allow everything that we haven't considered to be allowed. Um, our executes are all going to be forced to come from the initial super block on the device. That's the property boot verified. Um, and our kernel modules will also be required to come from the first super block on the device. Our next policy will be a continuation of the first. We're going to use it as a template and add another rule. Uh, this rule is going to be DM Verity root hash, which will allow us to uh, specify an individual DM Verity volume to either execute binaries from or load kernel modules from. The root hash in this case that we're going to be using is the root hash that we saved from an earlier step. Our third policy will be a continuation of the second. We're going to allow uh, any DM Verity signed volume, so anything that was mounted with the root hash signature argument provided by Verity setup and passed successfully. And we're also going to set up a revocation of the previous root hash. So what that means is uh, anything being executed or kernel modules being loaded from a volume, our previous root hash volume, will no longer be allowed, whether it's signed or not. We set up this revocation by moving our root hash rule up to the top because IP properties are executed from top to bottom. And then we switch that action equals allowed action equals deny. So this deny will act as a short circuit. It will prevent evaluation of any other rules. And as a result, we will just deny execution from that volume wholesale. As the scenario driving this policy is that we sign something incorrectly and want to uh, revoke trust for that volume, we're also going to bump the version number up to 0.0.1 so that none of the existing policies can be rolled back to. The fourth and final policy we're going to be making is very simple. It's going to be a policy comprised of two rules for our execute and two rules for our kernel module. It's going to be boot verified equals true, so anything from the initial super block, and DM Verity signature equals true. So this is any uh, DM Verity volume that has a signed root hash or mounted with a signed root hash will be allowed to execute or uh, load kernel modules. With all of our policies written, we're now going to sign all the policies. We do this once again through OpenSSL SMIME. This is almost identical to the way we sign our root hashes. However, it's important to notice the inclusion of the node attach uh, signature flag, which specifies that it is not a detached signature. It is, in fact, an enveloped signature. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mount my root file system under mount, and I'm going to copy all of our artifacts, our squashfs, our hash trees, our root hashes, our signatures, and our policies into my root file system so that we can have access to it in Kimu later. Um, and it also looks like our uh, kernel is done, so we can start getting ready on our demo. So as Kimu starts up, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load all the policies into the kernel. Uh, this is done simply through um, uh, writing the content to a certain file on the file system in SecurityFS. And then we're going to mark one of those policies as active. And then we're going to uh, run through some binaries that show various ways that uh, IP catches uh, potentially unverified uh, binary loads. So as I just said, we're going to load all of the policies into the kernel. Uh, we do this by writing the signed message into SecurityFS IPE new policy. Um, and we do this four times just to load all the individual policies. And this does not mean any of the policies are currently enforced. In fact, they are just waiting to be activated before they are enforced. 
Um, in addition, uh, when we activate or load a policy into the kernel, we have a audit record that shows the policy name, policy version, and the flat SHA-1 hash of the file that was loaded. This includes the, uh, the signature and so on and so forth. Once IP policies are loaded into the kernel, they get their own node under security FS IP policies and the policy name. Uh, there are two files inside that directory, and it is raw, which contains the original signed message that was uploaded to new policy or whatever stored in the kernel at the current time in the case of updates, as well as content, which is the other file, which is the plain text content of the policy in the signed message. With our policy loading out of the way, uh, we're now going to open our DM Verity volumes in the way that DM Verity expects, and then mount them on the file system to get the uh, binaries that we're trying to execute. So the way we do that is through Verity setup. We just do Verity setup open, the name of the, the block device, in our case, demo.squashofs. And then we have the hash tree, so demo.hash tree. And then we have the, you echo the, uh, the root hash, so without the new line, so that's, we just cat uh, demo.root hash, and then the optional uh, parameter root hash signature, and then the, the file name, which in our case is demo.b7s. Once again, we do this two times because we want two separate volumes with two separate hash trees and two separate root hashes for the purposes of our demo. After that, it creates a redirect device under dev mapper and whatever we put as our name, so we put demo as our name, and demo two, so we just mount uh, dev mapper demo on any particular directory. Or With all the test files out of the way, we're going to show the uh, demo files that we're going to be running as part of this uh, experiment. So the first up, we have exec. It's a simple binary. All it does is essentially the equivalent of hello world. Um, and then we have k module, which contains fuse, which we compiled um, earlier in the kernel compilation. We're just going to try inserting that. We have LD preload, so this is a binary that overwrites the RAND function to always return four. Um, and we're going to see if we can block that from being loaded. The final one is a lib, so this is just a simple binary that's linked to another library. And we're going to demonstrate that uh, if that library is unverified, it won't be allowed to load and the program will terminate. Uh, and protect. So this does one of two things. Uh, if we don't have the first argument, uh, then it does an anonymous memory mapping. Uh, this will always be rejected by all of our policies, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, if we include a file to first map that mem file uh, read write, and then uh, it will and protect it to execute. Finally, we have a script, which is just a simple Python script that we're going to show one way that it's subject IP policy, and another way where it's completely circumvents IP policy. We're just going to show now, because IP uh, has no active policy, it's allowing everything to load. Um, so we're just going to run through a couple test cases uh, and show that all these binaries can successfully execute. Now we're going to activate the policy boot. Um, as you remember, this is the boot verified equals true, meaning anything that belongs to the initial super block will be allowed to execute on the device. So right here, we're going to uh, execute our hello world binary, and we're going to see that it's going to be blocked uh, because it is not boot verified. So checking the audit log, IPE created an audit event, uh, the operation was execute under PID 272, the uh, process was shell, uh, it tried to launch execute, the second inode device DM0, we're going to check the rest of it, uh, it was DM Verity signed right there, yeah, so it was from a DM, signed DM Verity volume, it had a root hash, that's the uh, root hash. It was not boot verified because it was not the initial super block, so it blocked. The, it matched the rule default op equals execute, action equals deny. So this time going through our kernel uh, module, we're going to try to insert the kernel module using insmod. Uh, we're going to say permission denied. Let's check the audit event. The audit event says 284 PID. The operation was K module. The hook was kernel read. Uh, the process was uh, insmod, tried inserting fuse.ko, and as we can see, uh, all the properties are consistent with what we had before, and the rule that matched was default operation equals k-module, action equals deny. So now we're trying to do LD preload. We're gonna 
use the binary on the boot verify volume, run LD preload, where it's forcing the preload of share.so from the DM parity volume. And we're gonna see that LD denies loading that volume. We're gonna check the audit log and we're gonna see that it was uh, execute, trying to mmap the comms preload and the audit block was shared.so as we expected. Everything else is consistent with our operation before. Here I am just uh, screwing up a little bit. Uh, and protect is denied because it's on the boot verified volume, which uh, totally makes sense because we can't execute that. So we're gonna copy it to our boot verified volume and then we're gonna run it. And we're gonna see that the uh, anonymous failed. Uh, permission was denied. So checking the audit record, we noticed that uh, immediately that there's no audit path name. There's a, uh, it's just completely empty. It's because there is no file object when it comes to anonymous uh, memory, so we can't evaluate any of our properties, and so it matches the default rule. So now let's try and protect the file. We're going to try with itself from the boot verify volume. It's going to work because both the subject and the target are a boot verify, therefore it matches our rules. Now let's move on to scripts. So I'm going to first try to execute the script through um, uh, dot slash, and that's going to deny. And this is because the shell runs exec ve on that script and that uh, subjects it to the hook that we use um, to check for whether something can execute. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm um, going to try to invoke it through the interpreter. This does not uh, get blocked because the interpreter is verified. The interpreter opens the uh, Python script with read permissions, not execute permissions. And there is no equivalent execute permissions for open so it just completely executes the file. Uh, this is an obvious gap around IPE, and if you're interested in helping us close the gap, I recommend that you look at LKML for the uh, Omegzec patch series, which uh, is capable of addressing this problem. Now uh, let's switch policies. We're gonna switch to the root hash policy that we built before. So this will allow anything from a very specific DM Verity volume. Uh, I believe we have mounted that undersigned. And so we're just gonna run through the same things. Uh, exec's now allowed to run because it's belongs to that root hash. Uh, the kernel module can be inserted. Uh, I have to remove that kernel module because we're gonna use it later again. I'm gonna use rmod-f. Please don't do this in kernel, uh, um, actual kernels because obviously it taints the kernel as the warning says. Uh, now we're going to LD preload with the root hash. We're going to notice that it now succeeds. We get that statistically unlikely outcome because it loaded the overridden, overridden rand function. Uh, let's try mprotect. mprotect anonymous memory still fails as expected because if we look at the audit event, um, as I am scrolling up here, uh, we can see that it still has no file. And so uh, no file means it can't be traced to a boot verified volume, can't be traced to a DM Verity volume. So it matches the default rule. But if we mprotect the file itself, it works because that subject is DM Verity verified. Scripts still work the same way. Uh, we're gonna quickly switch policies to the policy that trusts everything by signature, uh, which is called signature. Um, so we're going to sissy tlip active policy equals signature. Oh wait, no, I want to uh, switch back to the root hash to demonstrate that uh, it was just authorizing that individual root hash. So we're going to go to sign2, which has a different root hash. We're going to try to execute something. It's going to be denied. Uh, we're going to try to execute something on the original signed volume. It's going to be allowed. We're gonna check the audit events of our denial, and it's going to show that um, it's going to belong to sign two exec. Uh, the root hash in it is uh, different from what we had before. Before I believe it started with a seven, it just starts with a five here, so we match our default rule. All right, so now let's activate our signature policy. Um, both of the volumes will be trusted with this policy, so we're gonna go to signed. Let's execute something off of signed, exec works. Signed to, uh, exec now works. 
Previously, it did not work because we were trusting one single root hash, but now we are trusting every signed root hash. Both volumes are allowed to execute and insert kernel modules with one rule. Now for the final part of our demo, we're going to activate the signature with the revoke policy. So this is everything signed, except we explicitly deny that first DM Verity volume. Uh, so if we go to signed, we're going to execute, execute fails, as rightfully so. If we check the audit log, we're going to see that the, D, the rule that was matched was our denial rule. And uh, we have to go all the way to the right for this. Uh, let's see here. And bam. The rule DM Verity root hash equals blah, blah, blah equals deny. So now let's try uh, preloading something off of that revoked volume. So we're going to do preload, ld preload equals that sign shared dot so, and it's going to fail. It's going to be ignored. Uh, we're going to try to unprotect something off of that volume, and it's going to fail because the subject is also not matching policy. Uh, if we look at the journal CTO, the audit logs, we're going to see both of them showed up. Hook M map, hook M protect, and we're going to try to insert the kernel module. It'll fail. Same reason. If we look at it, it's going to be kernel read, op equals kernel module. Um, if we go to sign two, we can insert views just fine because that's signed and it's not revoked, and we can also execute things off of sign two. So now that we've patched our security vulnerability with our uh, newly updated policy, let's make sure that we can't roll back. So we're going to try to activate our prior policy signature. It's going to fail with invalid argument, and we're going to check why. So if you remember, when we created this policy, we bumped the version to 0.0.1. But if we look at this the policy version of signature, it's 0.0.0. This is because IPE does a version check when you try to activate a policy. This prevents rollback attacks. So now that our policies, our older policies, are completely useless to us, let's delete them. So all we do is echo the name of the policy into securityfs IP delete policy, and the policies are unloaded from the kernel and freed. Um, there are requirements around this. It can't be the active policy, and it can't be what's known as the boot policy, which we'll go into very shortly. But as you can see, policies are cleared and can no longer be queried through the securityfs interface. Now we'll go into some of the sysctls that IP gives. The first one is sysctl IP enforce. This uh, switches IP between permissive mode and enforced mode. This is very similar to SE Linux, where uh, ultimately the policy is not enforced at the uh, end evaluation. However, the audit records are still generated for allow you to test policies uh, in a relatively unobtrusive manner to normal operation while you refine your policies. The remaining sysctls you can show by sysctl a grep ip it's active policy enforce strict parse and success audit the description of these can be found on ip's documentation so a little while ago i talked about a boot policy a boot policy is a policy that is applied at startup and to walk you through how to create a boot policy we're just going to go back to our linux kernel um, compilation process we're going to go back to security integrity policy enforcement menu and we have that option we skipped integrity policy to apply at system startup. That's going to be pointed to our, your plain text policy you wish to apply in our enforcement. Uh, in our case, we're going to do the boot policy. So we only trust the boot verified uh, items when we spring the system up. You start the kernel compile, uh, wait for that to complete, then start chemo with our new command, our new kernel. And when we bring the system up, we see that active policy is now in boot and the content of the security FS node of our active policy matches the plain text policy that we compiled into the kernel. For the future, we're looking at the ability to support the ability to indicate specific keys an authentication mechanism should result to, as opposed to if it's valid, let it through. We also want to support integrity verification for specific file reads. We're looking at accomplishing this through an original user land passed in path to establish the intent of user space, as well as a new flag for OpenAT2, similar to OpenAtExec. We also want to incorporate the OpenAtExec patch series into IP to address the script interpreter gap indicated previously. And the final thing on our immediate 
uh, list is resistance against rollback attacks. Right now, IPE has the option to compile an ideally minimal policy into the kernel to protect early user space. There exists a possible avenue of attack where before the policy is deployed in late user space, a previously deployed insecure policy is deployed and leveraged to gain a foothold on the device. We've noticed this that has the potential to affect several policy-based security systems and are looking trying to implement a generic interface for all these systems to leverage protections from this attack. Um, so someone asked what was the name of the patch series on LKML that I referenced. Uh, that is Exec. I was proposed by Mikhail Sung, and forgive me if I butcher that name. Um, another person asked what the upstream status is of uh, this policy mechanism. The end Verity uh, signatures have been in the kernel for a while. If you meant IP in general, uh, we're proposed, we're awaiting more review currently, um, and that's about it. Um, and then someone else asked, uh, all kernel modules have to be loaded from the first superblock, i.e. from the near MFS. Uh, this is all controlled by policy. Um, this is because, uh, so you can also really extend your policy to allow kernel modules being loaded from the Verity volumes. Um, and that's the last question I got was, do you know about the state of I am a directory appraisal. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, the last I heard was uh, in 2019, there was some to-do status regarding the directory appraisal, but uh, I'm not an IMA developer. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, my video is also down, so I can't, uh, in case anybody's wondering why you're looking at a black screen. All right, any more questions, anybody? Anyone? Okay, well, I guess we can call it here. Thank you, everybody.